Good evening, everyone, and uh, and welcome to uh, to Wiley's Baths. Um, if you haven't been here before, I can assure you that the pool always looks like that. Um, my name's Tony Cousins. I'm the chairperson of Wiley's Baths Trust. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be your host this evening. Before I introduce our, our esteemed guest speaker, I'd like to ask uh, the, the, the Mayor uh, of Ramwick City Council, um, uh, Philip of each, to say a couple of words, please. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'm Philip Veach, and here my name is Philippa. It's wonderful to be here. I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on unceded Bidjigal land and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and acknowledge all uh, Aboriginal people in attendance today. Uh, thank you, Tony, and to all of the executive of Wiley's Bars. Uh, we've got Councillor Michael Olive here as well. Yes, I've got quite a soft voice. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, for this uh, wonderful talk about the solar on Wiley's Bars. Council has been a really staunch supporter um, in regards to sustainability and, and solar. We've been doing it for many, many years now, uh, really over 20 years, and um, we've been able to deliver solar to, to many community organisations. Um, while he's been one of the notable ones, and uh, as well as um, over 25 schools in our LGA through the Solar Our Schools program. And we also offer uh, rebates to households for sustainability rebates for solar and other initiatives. Um, I've been very, one of the wonderful things about this is the incredible uh, connections and I suppose agreement between um, Ramick City Council, Wiley's Baths and many of these amazing people from UNSW, many of whom I've been lucky to know for a number of years, including uh, Oliver and Jürgen, and I've been lucky to meet uh, Renata and Torsten, and tonight we have uh, Martin Green here as well. So that connection with the UNSW School of Photovoltaic Energy and Renewable Engineering, which is a very long word, uh, and I'm sure most of you know that um, they broke the ground uh, in this field many, many years ago and were the first faculty uh, to do this and that. I believe 80% uh, of the... <laughs> I will talk about that, don't Yeah, I'll let you do all that. <laughs> but uh, UNSW is doing some amazing work and, and Council is very proud to part partner with them and support this initiative. So thank you very much for coming. It's great to see so many people here and uh, I hope you have a wonderful night. I'm looking forward to hearing the talk. So, so normally at this point of proceedings, the, the host would uh, uh, get out a piece of paper with a, a, a CV or a bio on it and, uh, uh, and introduce the guest speaker. Um, but we, that's not how things roll at Wiley's. Um, I first met Torsten um, well over 20 years ago, uh, just after we both moved to, to Coogee, in fact, and, um, and happened to find this beautiful place. Um, and so uh, I've known about uh, Torsten's professional capacity for, for many, many years. Um, notably, he takes the photographs at the swimming club Christmas event um, and typically often takes the photographs at the weekly swimming club Christmas event. And then I heard he actually worked at the university, so I was assumed he was studying photography. Um, and, uh, but, but that was only confirmed later on when I actually heard that he'd been promoted to um, some big job, big job at the University of New South Wales where he became a professor of taking photographs. Um, so I don't know what this school of photo stuff does, uh, but apparently that's what we're going to find out tonight. What I do know about this, the man standing next to me, he's been a wonderful contributor to this community. He is a machine in the ocean, in, in a, a terrific ocean swimmer, but those exploits have been surpassed by the job he and Dorothy Dorothy have done with their family, and we've seen that over the last 20 years with four beautiful young people um, that are part of this community. So, um, welcome, Professor Trupke. Professor, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Tony. Um, thank you, Philippa, for the uh, introduction. I want to thank uh, Wiley's Bus Trust for giving me the opportunity to talk here tonight. It's great to see an almost full house, so many people interested in solar technology, which is good to see. Um, 
Before I start, I want to acknowledge a few people. Um, first and foremost, Darina and her team. So Darina is the manager here at the bar. She's sitting there at the back giving us a wave. Um, so she's done a terrific job helping us setting everything here up and um, the chairs, the audio, the visual. Secondly, Robert Largent, he's over there. So he's uh, my colleague from UNISW. He's doing all the audio video tonight and he always does a terrific job at that stuff as well. And I always already give you a disclaimer here. The presentation tonight will contain a lot of data, a lot of slides, a lot of graphs. Some of it may go over your heads, but the presentation will be recorded and the video will be available on Wiley's Bath website. It will be available on our school website. So you will be able to review some of this stuff. And if that's not the case, you can ask me, you can send me an email um, at any time if you have any specific questions. Um, and with that, I also want to mention Courtney, of course. Courtney, she's here somewhere as well. So she helped also with some uh, audio setup. And of course, she was the bath manager back in 2021 when the solar system that we're kind of celebrating here tonight was actually installed. And before I actually start the presentation, I'm going to embarrass Dorothy. I'm going to thank her for being supportive of myself, including my entire family, uh, for many years and uh, putting up with me. Thank you. That was, the, um, that was the emotional part of the presentation. <laughs> so <coughs> the reason why we're here tonight, or the excuse why we're here tonight, is the installation of a PV system here on the roof on one of the buildings. You see it here actually in the top left corner, top right. This is what we refer to as Marco's shed. And the PV system is installed on the roof. And um, back then in 2021, I promised Randby Council that in return for some very generous financial support of, for the installation of the system, I would give a public lecture. Uh, that was actually scheduled for 2021, but had to be canceled due to COVID. And back then I was a bit disappointed, but that gives us a chance to be here tonight and uh, be here at this absolutely sensational facility. Uh, for those of you who are not regular, regulars here, have a look afterwards, look over the the, the, the balcony here, you can see it's absolutely spectacular. So th this is really just the excuse why we're here tonight. The real reason is, and why I want to talk to you, is that there is actually a global energy revolution taking place. And that is the core of this presentation. And as you will see, this global ener energy revolu revolution is well and truly on its way. So here's the agenda, an overview, what I'm going to talk about. This is a talk about to a general audience, I guess. So I will start by providing you with some information, some basics, some nomenclature, nomenclature so that you hopefully can understand some of the data I will talk about later in a little bit more detail. And then in the main presentation, I will talk about the past, the present and the future of solar energy, which I refer to as the big picture. And in the very last part of the talk, I will then talk about specifically about the system here at Wiley's Bath, which is the smaller picture and I will show you that Wiley's Bath is actually now a small part of that much bigger revolution. So this is a picture of uh, Wiley's Bath. You can see here in the top left, this is Marco's shed. You can see the PV system here on the roof. But we also have here on the boys and the girls change rooms, we have these so-called solar thermal systems. And the first clear distinction I want to make is that these are two fundamentally different cups of tea. Yeah? Solar thermal is when you have black surface, the sun shines on it, it gets hot, you run water over it and you heat water with it. And then you can use that hot water to have a hot shower. And we have two of these systems here. That's not what we're talking about tonight. What we're talking about is called photovoltaics. And photovoltaics is the direct generation of electricity using solar panels. And you see a picture here. This is actually our solar system here at Wiley's Bars. You can see Wedding Cake Island in the background, quite beautiful. And to my mind, this is an absolute thing of beauty. Yeah, you have these flat panels sitting on a roof, the sun shines on them, and you get electricity out of them. It's, it's a miracle, to be honest, but it's a miracle that works. And when we talk about solar systems, we distinguish broadly three different categories. The first one is residential systems. The wireless bus system here is one of them. Typical size is something like 10 kilowatts. Then we have commercial systems. Aldi, Ikea, they put solar systems on their roofs, typical size maybe several hundred kilowatts. And then 
On the other side of the scale, we have the large utility scale solar farms, which are up to 100 megawatt or up to gigawatts in scale. And to give you some idea, a residential rooftop system may be something like 25 panels, a commercial system a few hundred or a few thousand panels, and then the utility scale solar farms, they have several hundred thousand panels or even several millions of panels. Humongous systems. Now what happens to the electricity that we generate with the solar panels on the roof? It is very important to understand that, of course, a solar panel cannot store the electricity. It, gener it generates electricity and something needs to be done with that electricity instantly. And the best thing we can do, that's number one, is to use it on site. Yeah, that's indicated here by the red arrows. We can use that electricity instantly to power the television, the microwave, or the oven, or the, the, um, the air conditioner. So that is the best way of doing it, and also, as you will see, the most economical way of using solar power. But there are instances where we have more solar on the roof than we can actually use at home. And then we need to take care of that electricity. And one thing we can do is to store that electricity. That's indicated by this red arrow here. You see here's a couple of batteries. So we can store the electricity that we cannot use instantly, put it in a battery, and then we can use that stored electri electricity at another time. For example, in the late afternoon, in the evening, at night time or next morning. And then there's the third thing we can do, and that is to transport that electricity somewhere else. Electric energy has this amazing property that we can transport it very, very easily using electric wires. So one thing we can do with electricity if we don't have a battery, we can actually send it somewhere else and in the context of residential rooftop systems, that's what we refer to as feeding in the electricity. Yeah? So we talk about a feed-in tariff, that's the money we get paid when we don't use our solar electricity on site but send it into the grid. And this is what these batteries could look like. Yeah? So we have a residential battery here on the left hand side, that's the Tesla battery, it looks very nice. Typical capacity, 5 to 10 kilowatt hours. And then on the opposite side of the scale, we have huge residential, uh, sorry, utility scale batteries. This is actually a artist's impression of a 2.4 gigawatt hour battery that will be built in Victoria. It just got approval. And to give you an idea, the ratio between these two batteries is about 200,000. So this battery on the right hand side will store 200,000 times the electricity, the energy that the residential rooftop, the residential uh, battery can store. Then we have electric cars, and they will also play an important role in the future. This is a Tesla, you might think it's very beautiful. I prefer German, <laughs> German cars, to be honest, um, as, as you probably know. Um, but the battery in this car, this Tesla Model S, has a capacity of 60 to 100 kilowatt hours. Now, I would like to invite you to go home tonight, look at your electricity bill, and check how much electricity you use at home in your household. And I bet it will be something like 15, 20, or 25 kilowatt hours. So what that means is that car stores enough electricity, enough energy in its battery, so you could run your entire house for four or five days. Of course, you're never going to do that. But what this shows is that car batteries can be an extremely important buffer to store electricity. You know, you might have your car charged during the day, then you drive home, you use 10% of your battery, you use some at home, and then you drive back to work the next day and charge the battery again. That's going to be a scenario that we will have in the future. So that was just some background information, and now I will talk about the real reason why we need to look at photovoltaics. Yeah, so I'm a scientist, I'm a physicist, so I believe in science. Um, some people don't, but I believe that these bullet points here are fundamentally true. We live in the age of anthropogenic climate change. It's a difficult word to pronounce, anthropogenic. It means human-made climate change. And it's also clear to me that energy supply is a major contributor to climate change. You know, the way we generate electricity, the way we use electricity, is one of the major contributors to climate change. And if we want to avoid these climate change um, processes to get completely out of control, that means that the way we as humans need how we generate, distribute, store, and use electricity must change. And as I will show you in the next 40, 45 minutes, it has started to, to change, and it's actually started to change very, very radically. So the global transition away 
from fossil fuels towards renewables is well underway. And I will show you that electricity generated using solar cells is one of several key elements in what is going to be a relatively complex puzzle and that is that major energy transition that we're going through right now. Now, I show you that sort of rather dramatic picture there on the bottom right. You see the earth is melting. I could have used other pictures like this one here, a couple of rather sad looking polar bears, you know, not knowing where to go, or some melting ice shelves. And that is the sort of emotional language that we would have used possibly even just 10, 15 years ago to justify why we need to switch to renewables. But, <coughs> yeah, I'm afraid that, especially here in the eastern suburbs, we're probably at the forefront of that. We as humans are probably sufficiently selfish that these arguments would only ever get us so far in terms of transitioning to renewables. But the good thing is there is a much more compelling argument right now that drives that energy transition. Sorry, it's not the polar bears. Going the wrong way. That's this symbol here. It's the dollars. The transition towards renewables is purely driven by economics. And that's what I, I hope I'm going to convince you of in the next couple of slides. So that takes us to the past of uh, solar energy. This picture here, kindly provided by Martin, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see those three researchers. They are actually um, three Americans from Bell Labs, and they are actually credited with um, designing and making the very first silicon solar cell. You can see this happened in the 1950s, in the early 1950s. And what is remarkable is that this discovery or this scientific development actually made front page news on the New York Times at the time. Yeah? This is an article from the front page of the New York Times from 1954. And the article, the title is Vast Power of the Sun is Tapped by Battery Using Sand Ingredient. So I will translate that for you. In the early days of solar technology, solar cells were referred to as solar batteries. So that's what they mean by battery. They're just talking about solar cells. And when they talk about sand ingredient, of course, they mean silicon. Yeah? Silicon is silicon dioxide. So the main ingredient in sand is silicon. And back then, they were thinking that the future of solar was, was silicon. And I want to read you a short extract from that article. This new device, the solar cell, may spark the beginning of a new era leading eventually to the realization of one of mankind's most cherished dreams, the harnessing of the almost limitless energy of the sun for the use of civilization. Yeah, sounds very dramatic and is actually accompanied, accompanied by these sort of very dramatic pictures as well. But what I find rather remarkable is this article is from 1954. We're now in 2024. This is 70 years ago. And as you will see, this vision that is portrayed in this article, we are now living through the era where this vision is actually becoming a reality. Now, we can't talk about the past of solar without talking about the absolutely outstanding contributions that our university, the University of New South Wales, have, ma have made. Not me personally, but um, you see these pictures here. Um, they're quite epic pictures for those in the R&D community. We know all these people. But there's one outstanding figure. You see him here in the forefront here and also there in the bottom sporting a very interesting hairdo actually. Uh, this is Martin Green and Martin is here tonight with his wife Judy. I would like to ask him to stand up briefly, Martin, if you could. And all of us give him a round of applause <laughs> if you can sit down again. Um, so we've had Taylor Swift here recently. Um, <laughs> In terms of Martin standing in our R&D community, it is probably comparable to that. And I'm, I'm personally grateful for, for, because Martin is also the one who brought me and my family to Australia. So I have a lot to thank him for. But the entire world has a lot to thank him for. And that is shown here on the right hand side graph. Because what this shows is a chart that shows the history of solar cell world record efficiencies over several decades. And each of these red symbols here is a world record that was set by the University of New South Wales, here in your backyard. <laughs> Pretty incredible, right? And you might think, oh yeah, sure, they improved it from 18% to 25%. You should think of this like a, a world record 100 meter sprint, you know? Most of the people here would think, oh, I can probably run 100 meters in 25 seconds, 20 seconds, 
I'd probably I'll still be in. But then when it gets to 18, 17, 16, it gets harder and harder. And the further you get towards what's fundamentally possible, it gets exponentially harder. And despite that fact, you can see here that the uni group at UNSW, led by Martin, has actually pushed the silicon solar cell efficiency further and further to its fundamental limit. And it's absolutely remarkable. Now, you see this weird acronym, PERC? That is actually representative of a specific cell technology that was developed at UNSW by Martin and his team. And you will find it interesting that this technology that was developed in the mid-1980s late, late made it into full-scale production only about 30 years later. And today, about, Martin, I don't know, what is it, 80, 85% or 90%? 90% of all silicon solar cells that are manufactured around the world are using this technology. Yeah, so hundreds of billions of dollars of product are made using UNSW technology. Quite amazing. Really is. Now, this is one of my favorite charts when it comes to the past of solar. This is what we refer to as the photovoltaic learning curve. Learning curves are used in economics quite broadly, for example, for microchips, but we also use it in solar. And what a learning curve shows is how the price of a certain product comes down as more and more of it is made. Yeah, so what we show here on the x-axis is effectively the cumulative PV module shipment. So this is how much how many solar modules effectively have been shipped and installed worldwide. On the y-axis, we have the price of solar panels. And you can see the data sh start here in the top left in the mid-1970s, and they go all the way to the bottom right, which is where we are today. Now, I want to note that this is a so-called double logarithmic chart, if you know what that means. What it means is that both the x and the y-axis cover a huge range. Yeah, so you can see the price here in 1970s was something like $200 per watt peak. I'll explain later what that means. Whereas I believe in early January this year we reached 11 or 10 cents per watt peak. Martin, is that right? So we've seen a drop from $200 to 10 cents per watt peak. That's a factor of 2,000. So a panel that you buy today for a certain price would have cost $2,000 more uh, back then. That is remarkable. What's even more remarkable is how much the installed base of modules has grown. Uh, in 1977, we had one megawatt peak. Um, the system here at Riley Spa's Marco system is 10 kilowatts. So effectively, in 1977, we had the equivalent of 100 rooftop systems like this one here. Nothing, effectively. Every suburb in Sydney has more installed right now. But then you can see 2022, we reached a very important milestone of the first one terawatt of installed PV capacity. So over those 50 years, the installed PV capacity has grown one million times. Yeah, 10 to the six times it has grown. And I know that like units such as megawatt, gigawatt, terawatt probably don't mean much to you. But remember, one terawatt was reached in 2022. That was a very important milestone and I'll refer to it again later on. I want to put that in perspective for you. This is a picture of the rather infamous coal-fired power station Loi Yang A, which is in the La Trobe Valley. This power station has a nominal capacity of 2.2 gigawatts, so if it runs at full blast, which it rarely ever does, uh, it outputs 2.2 gigawatt, and the 1.3 terawatt of solar that we've installed right now effectively generate the equivalent of 200 of those coal-fired power stations. So what you can see is we have moved away from a situation where solar can be considered, you know, a little joke that some greenies like to do. We now have a situation where solar is replacing 200 very large coal-fired power stations around the world. And that is something that we can already be quite proud of, but um, yeah, as you will see, it pales against what we're going to see in the next 20 years. Another way of putting this is that these um, 200, sorry, 1.3 terawatt effectively generate enough electricity to power Australia 10 times over. Yeah? So 10 countries like Australia are entirely powered by solar right now. Amazing. Back to pricing. This is a linear chart and that shows, I think, in a more dramatic way how prices have come down over time. And again, I'm using these weird units of dollars per watt peak. You will see in a second what that means. But again, look at this. 2009 four dollars per watt peak 2024 10 cents per watt peak so even just in the last 15 years prices have dropped 40 times or in other words we're paying two and a half percent of what we would have paid 15 years ago now you could think all right well prices have come down 
could mean they've just come down from astronomical to still being ridiculously expensive. But what I will show you that the opposite has occurred. What we have seen is a transition from solar being, in fact, a very expensive technology to being now the cheapest way of creating electricity and generating electricity. The solar panels that we use here at Wiley's Bath are made by a company called QCells, originally German, but only the manufacturer primarily in Asia. And each solar panel that you can purchase and put in your roof has a rating in units of watt peak. So what that means is if you put that panel on your roof, sun shines in the middle of the day, that panel outputs about 350 watts. Now remember I said to you before, the price of these panels has dropped to about 12 cents per watt peak. So if we multiply that price per watt peak by 350 watts, we end up with a number of $42. Yeah? 42 is the answer, of course. Um, <laughs> some of you got that <laughs> reference, I guess. But at this point of the presentation, I actually would have expected some of you to have facial expressions like this one here, or maybe turn to your neighbor and say, I think Torsten has lost his marbles, because this can't be right. We're getting rain? Doesn't matter. Um, let's hope it doesn't get worse. Anyway, you should think about this. This is an electronic high-tech product that is two square meters in size. It has 144 high-efficiency silicon solar cells in it. Can you still hear me at the back? All good? Okay. So we have this absolutely incredible high-tech uh, device, which is a solar panel, two square meters in size, 144 cells in it. It has ultra-clean glass on the front. It's got aluminum frames. It's got uh, cables, junction box, and all this for $42. I reckon you must be kidding me. But this is the reality today, that we can buy these panels for ridiculously low prices. Now, the price of a panel is one thing, but what does that mean for the actual price of generating electricity. So this is a chart, and I've thought long and hard of how I would uh, get that message across. It's not a simple story, but people refer to the so-called levelized cost of electricity. So what economists, economists can do is they can say, okay, we build a, a power plant, whether it's a nuclear power plant or coal-fired power station or a solar farm, we take into account how much does it cost to build, what's the cost of capital, how much does it cost to run, and eventually how much does it cost to decommission. And that is all taken into account, and then they calculate how much does it cost using all these numbers to generate one kilowatt hour, or as in this case, one megawatt hour. And this is what IEMO and CSIRO do every year, and they report this in the so-called Gen Cost Report. And what you see here is a comparison of black coal, gas, then black coal with carbon capture and storage, gas with carbon capture and storage, and then we have variable renewables with firming. Variable renewables with firming, what that means is that we're looking at an energy system that has solar and wind primarily, but it also has means to provide electricity to you when the sun doesn't shine and when the wind doesn't blow. So that includes storage, it includes distribution, and it potentially includes gas peaking plants and so on. But this is actually a calculation for an energy system that is almost 100% renewable. And you can see, if you just compare the blue bars here, this is 2023, this firm renewable power system comes in at the lowest price per megawatt hour. And really what we should be comparing it with is black coal with carbon capture and storage. And you can see that is pretty much three times more expensive or, capture, uh, or gas with carbon capture and storage. And that's still about two times more expensive. So the bottom line of this slide is variable, a, 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 a energy system based on renewables firmed by other means is now the cheapest way of of creating electricity in Australia. And that's, again, remarkable, I believe. And that is what's driving this energy transition that I was talking about. Now, you can believe that or not, but here is a graph that shows data that Andrew Blake from ANU has collated. And this shows how much energy generation capacity was actually installed over the years. So I'll spend a couple of minutes on this chart. So you see on the left, we have solar, then we have wind, we have gas, coal, and others. And then we have four, sorry, six colored bars for each technology for each year. So you can actually see how much new generation capacity was added into the system worldwide in each year. And the first thing to note is that by far the highest bars are solar. 
Yeah, so far more solar was installed in these years than from any other um, source of energy, source of electricity. And that alone means that an increasing proportion of our energy mix is coming from renewables. The second thing you see is that if you compare the bars here on the left hand side for solar, you can see that every year it gets a little bit bigger. So the, the number of PV panels that gets installed every year is actually growing. And what that means is that transition towards renewables is not just happening, it's actually accelerating. At the same time, if you look at coal, for example, yes, people are still installing coal, but it's getting less and less and less every year. Important to note, we're looking here at the net new deployment. So what that means is it's a difference between new capacity coming online and old capacity being retired. So if you put 10 coal-fired power stations in and you retire five, you have a net addition of five. Yeah? Now you might say, oh, Torsten, yeah, you're showing us old data here from 2021. What's happened in the last couple of years? So I found some data on Bloomberg for the PV installations in 2022 and 2023. 240 gigawatts and 400 gigawatts, and you can see that actually exceeds this scale quite substantially. So I just shrunk this graph, the entire graph, to be able to put this data on here. And you can see this is 2022, this is 2023. Love Loving it? <laughs> yeah, love Annette, Annette loved it. Love it. <laughs> and you will see this is small to what we're gonna have in the future. This is already ridiculous how solar deployment dominates the new energy, energy capacity that we're adding. And um, yeah, you will see, look on the bottom right here, uh, there's nuclear. Yay. Hey, <laughs> nuclear, hey. Uh, Peter Dutton and Angus Taylor, they love talking about nuclear. My view is they do it to diffuse the discussion and, and just muddy the waters. I suggest someone show these guys this, this graph and ask them, what is it that you guys know that everyone in the el else in the world doesn't? Because clearly, you can see the world is going renewable. And the reason for going renewable is not because they want to save the planet. That might be a secondary motivation. The reason is that golden sign that you saw at the be beginning, because it is the most economical way of doing it. Yes, nuclear, hey? That was my rant. And if you have questions on nuclear, please feel free to ask later on in the Q&A section. I've, I'm very passionate about talking, it, talking about it, but what this shows is nuclear is not growing. Most of these bars are actually at zero or below zero. That means the actual nuclear capacity around the world is actually declining. More capacity is being taken offline than is being built. So don't believe people who tell you, oh yeah, but there are some people building nuclear power stations in the UK or whatever. Yes, they do, but most people don't. <laughs> now, we see in this chart that more and more electricity capacity is installed that is renewable. That means the percentage of the total energy mix uh, that is from renewables is also growing. So I wanted to get a bit of engagement here by the audience. So I would like to do a show of hands. And I want, this is global data. Um, when we talk about Australia, what do you think is the percentage of renewable electricity in Australia right now? So a show of hands, who believes it is more than 40%. Don't, the, the UNSW guys, don't raise your hands <laughs> because you know the numbers. If Alistair is here, he knows it probably to the last decimal. Um, so we've got one taker, two, three. More than 30%, not many. More than 20, a lot more. Between 10 and 20%, Dorothy. <laughs> Less than 10%. Yeah, okay. So the majority I reckon was between zero and 20%. percent you will be surprised. This is the chart, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will, don't worry. I will explain it. So this is a website, if you're a bit nerdy or technically um, interested, openem.org.au, have a look at it, it's amazing. You can look at a lot of data uh, from Australia, from the NEM, from different states different times. What I've plotted here is the total electricity generation in Australia. Well, it's the NEM. So the NEM is the national electricity market. And as you see here at the top, it basically covers all of Australia except for the NT and Western Australia. So for the sake of this argument, we'll say this is just representative of Australia. And I think it is actually pretty close. So what you see is data covering 25 years. 
Uh, but on the, on the left, we have 1999. On the right, we have 2024. So this is the last 25 years. And the height of this color chart tells you how much electricity was generated and consumed every year. So you see there's a bit of seasonal fluctuation. Yeah? Every year it goes up and down. That's because depending on whether you turn air conditioners or heating, it, it goes up and down a bit. But you can see that from about 1999 to 2008, the total electri electricity demand actually went up quite a bit. That's interesting, but since then, you can see it's been flat. I don't know why. It's an interesting observation. Um, but what it means, it, in particular since the actual population of Australia has grown since then, that the electricity demand per capita has actually declined. That is nice. It's good to see, but not the main purpose for this slide. The main purpose is if you look at the colors in this graph. Yeah, Dorothy is amazed. Could have talk, I could have told you that at home. Yeah, maybe I need to do more private lectures at home. I, don't, I need to do more lecturing at home, I think. Lecture, lecture Dorothy and the kids. Anyway, you see the colors here. You will guess brown and black means black and brown coal, or brown and black coal. And you can see that on the left-hand side in the early 2000s, almost all the electricity in Australia was from coal, 90, whatever, 99%. Then you see in this lot of light brownish color, that's gas. And you can see that starts creeping in over time. But then the important colors are blue, green, and yellow. Blue is, blue is hydropower, green is wind, and yellow, of course, is solar. And we can see that from the 2000s, Five onwards, we got a bit of hydro popping up, so the blue is getting bigger. Then from, I need to put my glasses on. Yeah, from about 2010, you can see green starts being significant. And especially since 2015, you can see the, the yellow is actually popping up quite substantially. And if you look at the right-hand side of this chart, that's 2024. And if you look at the combined capacity of the yellow, the green, and the blue, you can see that that actually makes up a very, very large chunk of all electricity that was generated in Australia. And the OpenNEM website allows you to download this data. So we can see, and this is, in my view, surprising and a real good, feel good story, isn't it? Rooftop solar alone generated almost 15% of all electricity in Australia in January 2024, last month. Add to that almost 10% from utility scale solar. Add to that almost 12.5% from wind. Add to that about 5.5% from hydro, and you end up with 42% yes. of... James was right. <laughs> he had his hand up, and, uh, and Emma as well. Well done. But most of you were wrong. And if, I, if you had... <laughs> yes, well, you have to acknowledge that. <laughs> you got it wrong. And I would have got it wrong too if I hadn't looked at this data, because I was uh, surprised by this myself. But this is, this is the result of that chart that I showed you on the last slide, this, this increasing number of photovoltaic and, and renewable energy systems that are being built. That means renewables are taking over. Yeah? You see, I put these guides to the eye in here, and you can see how this red triangle is growing. That, that wedge actually represents how solar, wind, and hydro are taking over the energy and electricity system in Australia. Amazing, huh? And this is... This is just from 2011, so this is just 12 years ago. So imagine if we extrapolate this another 12, 15 years into the future, we are already from zero to 42% in just 12, 13 years. It is not very hard to see. I believe this transition will actually accelerate. It's not hard to see how by 2040, we will have 90% or more renewable in our system in Australia. And that is a feel-good story, isn't it? I think so. And this is what this looks like, yeah? This is residential rooftop systems. If you go to Western Sydney, you see a lot of suburbs with this extremely high penetration of solar systems. That's, of course, because yeah, you use air conditioning there um, and you can run the air conditioner straight from your solar panels, which makes it extremely cost-effective. And then on the other side of the scale, we have these large utility-scale solar farms. In these farms, we typically have the solar panels mounted on what we call single-axis trackers. You see a picture here. So what they do is actually they rotate the panels from morning to evening so that they basically follow the sun from east to west. Yeah? And that, of course, maximizes the amount of energy that these uh, 
these solar panels can harvest the, the amount of electricity that they can generate. Yeah, Annette, this is what they look like. Uh, I spoke to Annette earlier. She said she, she drove past a solar farm in Australia, in Glen Rowan, actually, where me and my team did some field work recently. That is a 100 megawatt solar farm. And Annette told me how yeah, blown away she was by the sheer scale of that solar farm. This is, and this one in Australia is a 100 megawatt solar farm. This one here, this photo, is of the Aldafa solar farm. And this is not an AI generated picture. This is a two gigawatt solar farm that was recently completed and commissioned. Four million panels in a single solar farm where you have kilometers and kilometers one direction and several kilometers in the other direction of solar panels. That is what, happen what happens actually on the other side of Anzac Parade in, in the real world. Yeah? And I'm sure some of you guys are not aware of this. This is happening in the real world. It's, it's absolutely mind-blowing. And these solar farms will pop up in Australia as well. And if my information is correct, they will get even bigger. They will grow to five or 10 gigawatts per solar farm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah? This is another picture. Yeah? Mind-blowing how big these solar farms are. Absolutely ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. I think this is fantastic. And I get excited about pictures like this. <laughs> now, the most important or most exciting part of the presentation is, is yet to come. And that is when we talk about the future of solar technology. Now you see Doc and Marty here. They have a fairly uh, amazed expression on their faces. And I believe some of you will have possibly similar expressions when I show you what we and the experts believe is going to happen over the next 20, 30 years, which is nothing short of incredible. So this is a chart. Again, I apologize, too many charts. This is actually a chart that shows you what a large group of experts predict to happen in the future. And I want to preempt this slide with a statement about forecasts. Groups like the International Energy Agency have made forecasts about solar adoption for decades. And for decades, they got it wrong. They always continuously and consistently underestimated the amount of solar that would be installed. So solar has always outperformed even the most optimistic predictions. And that's the background for this slide. So this is the prediction that we have right now. And again, I want to explain to you what we're looking at here. So obviously on the x-axis, we have time from 2010 to about 2060. And there's an orange and a blue curve on here. The orange curve actually shows you what the experts predict in terms of annual installation capacity. Yeah, remember I told you we had about 400 gigawatts of extra solar in 2023. That's about here on this chart, and that's about this data point here. And as you can see, the experts predict, and it's important to note again that this is a logarithmic chart, that by 2040, we will reach three to four terawatt of module capacity per annum. What that means is that for every factory that we have now that makes modules, we'll have 10 factories in 12 years time. What it also means is, I told you, we had installed the first terawatt of solar in 2022. By 2040, we will install three to four times that amount every year. So the, the amount of solar that we had installed globally, cumulatively over 30 years, three times that will be installed every year in 2040. <laughs> Insane. The and again, the, the solid lines here, that's the, of course the historic data and the dashed line, that's the prediction. The blue line is even more insane. Um, that is actually the total cumulatively installed capacity. So orange is how much we install every year. Blue is how much installed capacity we will have at any given point in time. And you will see that this chart here actually reaches 70 to 80 terawatt by 2050. And I know for most people, numbers like this are a bit meaningless and completely out of context. But first of all, 70, 80 terawatt means if we had one terawatt installed in 2022, that means for every solar panel that is installed today, we'll have 70 to 80 solar panels installed in 20, 30 years time. That is amazing. The other thing that's amazing is this capacity of solar will generate about 15 terawatt continuously 24 hours a day. And that is about, you need to listen to this. Annette, you were distracted. No, you need to listen up. <laughs> So <laughs> this is important. So the solar installation in 2050 will generate three to four times more electricity than the entire world generates today from coal, gas, nuclear, renewables combined. 
unbelievable, isn't it? You sit there and you know, why not? It's, it's, it is really incredible. And you might wonder, where is this electricity going to go? This is what the experts call the electrification of everything. Yeah? We're going to have electric cars, we have electric ships. A lot of industries which cannot use electricity right now will be electrified. And that is because electricity from solar will be dirt cheap in the future. And that will drive economies that are just not viable at the moment. Now, once again, 3 to 4 terawatt. Yeah? Remember that chart? I showed you this is 2022, this is 2023. Shall we have a look at what this is going to look like in 2040? Yeah. So to do that, I need to rescale this chart again. And here's the chart for 2040. Put it in pink. Everyone loves pink. This is the Barbie chart. And you can see that it absolutely dwarfs everything else. And I appreciate this is 2040 data for solar. I haven't updated for the others, but it's absolutely clear that no other technology will come near this. Yeah? So solar technology will dominate the world over the next 20, 30 years. It will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, it can be cynical about it, but I, I am convinced that this will happen. And uh, I think I've got a couple of good years in me, so I think I'm going to see, I'm going to live to see the day where this is actually going to become a reality. I will. And again, reminded you, this is not driven by uh, ecological reasons, that is the secondary aspects. The people who put money up, the people who, people who invest in energy assets, they do this to, to make money. And the dollar sign is the reason why they're doing it. Now, <laughs> let's talk about land area requirements. You might say, oh, okay, we've got all these solar, where are they going to go? Where is this all going to go? And this is a bit of a funny story. Um, my team and I, Oliver, Jürgen, Alex, we were in a country Victoria recently at a solar farm in Glen Rowan. And um, we were actually, after a long day at work, you can see here we're enjoying a couple of soft drinks on the veranda of our Airbnb. And the veranda had this absolutely amazing view of the spectacular countryside there in Victoria. There was kangaroos, there was echidnas, there was alpacas. It was really, really amazing. Um, and then we were kind of browsing the internet and we found this article was, which was actually released on that day in the Sunday Morning Herald's call to cancel renewable rollout. Nationals declare the bush is full. <laughs> we, we, couldn't, we couldn't stop laughing. We thought, look at this. I mean, yeah, the bush isn't full. We've driven here 700 kilometers, kilometers from Sydney. The bush isn't full. I've done a bit of a calculation to show how much land is actually required for all this solar. Yeah, so remember, remember 70, 80 terawatts. If we say we want to put 10 of these 70, 80 terawatts into Australia, this is the land that would be required, indicated here by this red um, square. And please don't quote me saying, Torsten said, we're going to have a 10 terawatt solar farm in the middle of Australia. <laughs> this is this just to give you an idea how much land would be needed. This is about 450 by 450 kilometers. And it's equivalent to about 2.5% of the Australian land mass. 2.5% would give you enough space for 10 terawatts. Enough space for 10 times the solar that is installed worldwide right now. This solar installation would gener generate enough electricity to power 75% of the entire world's electricity right now. So you can see, yeah, the bush, is it full? I don't think so. You look at this, Australia is really in prime position. It's got so much land space and so much of it cannot really be used for much else. So I believe there's a real vision for Australia to install a lot more solar than we actually need here ourselves and for solar to then become a net exporter of energy. And there's a lot of people who think about how that could actually be implemented in practice. Yeah, yeah. More, more places in other parts of the world, North Africa, Saudi Arabia, there's plenty of space in the world to install 70 terawatts of solar. So that concludes um, the first section of my talk. I've got maybe 10 minutes to go. Promise, Dorothy, is that okay? Um, so summarizing this, the integration of renewables, I've, I've painted a very rosy picture, of course. The integration of renewables with a high penetration of solar PV is obviously not trivial. There is technical challenges associated with this, market challenges, but challenges create opportunities and that actually drives innovation. Um, it is clear to me that this transition towards renewables, it will happen and it will happen anyway. It is driven by economics. 
But if we want to achieve optimal outcomes, then this transition must, ha must happen in an organized way, in a systematic way. It must be based on systematic long-term planning, and that in turn requires political leadership. And when do we want it? Now. Yes. We can hope, of course. So the summary here is solar is just one of uh, several very important technical elements of this energy revolution. Storage is important, small batteries, large batteries, electric vehicles, electric vehicle to grid solutions where batteries from electric vehicles charge back into the grid. Pumped hydro is another big one. Distribution. You could build a high voltage DC transmission line from Perth to Sydney if you want. You could have a big solar farm in Perth, a big solar farm in Sydney. Now I need to get this right. In, in Perth, when it's midday, uh, it's evening in, a, in Sydney, and you can transport the electricity back. Vice versa, when it's midday in Sydney and the sun is shining and it's not so shining in Perth, you can feed electricity and charge people over in, in Perth. And that is one of the solutions that makes this whole energy transition a lot easier and a lot more effective. And finally, there's demand side management. Very, very important. Demand side management means that you're adjusting your electricity consumption to the demand. And it's nothing new. We've done this for many, many years. We turn on our electric hot water heater at night, and that's because traditionally, at nighttime, we used to have excess electricity that couldn't be used. So we were encouraged with financial incentives to use electricity at nighttime. In the future, all this means is this will reverse, and people will be incentivized to turn things on during the day. Electric heaters, charge your car, turn on your washing machine, all this will be pushed into the day. That's what's called demand side management. And the summary here is Australia is really, really in pole position to exploit all these opportunities that are coming up. And yeah, I believe they're uh, once more probably going to be the lucky country. So that takes me to the very last part of the presentation, which is to talk about the system here at Wiley's Bath, which is going to be much fun, I hope. Um, you see here some beautiful pictures. You've seen them before. I want to give a shout out to IQ Solar, Mark Abicht, who is here. He actually, he's waving his hands there. He supported the installation of this sol the solar system here. And IQ Solar have also supported me. We've done some research here actually on the system on behalf of the UNIS, uh, UNIS w team. And they were always very responsive. They've always been um, very quick to support us. And I'm, I'm very, very appreciative of that. The other thing that we have here is the, sol the so-called solar analytics system. This is a monitoring service that this company in Australia offers, especially to residential rooftop owners. So they actually monitor the performance of your system and then they check that everything is okay and if your solar system underperforms, if something has happened, if the inverter has tripped or something like that, they send you a warning and then you can take appropriate action. So the system here on the roof on Marco's shed, you can see it, well not in the dark, but um, this was installed in March 2027, uh, sorry, 2021. It consists of 35 uh, Q-cells solar panels and in peak performance it'll generate 10 kilowatt AC. Yeah, that's limited by the inverter. And as you can see, the panels are just mounted flat on the roof. They don't, they don't move. There's no moving parts in this system. And um, yeah, before I continue, I want to give a shout out. Is Alistair here? No, I don't think so, is he? No. Anyway, we had a student, David Mould, he, he actually did his fourth year thesis here at Wiley's Bath and his topic was net zero at Wiley's Bath and uh, that student was sup actually um, supervised by Alistair and myself and he did a terrific job. He did a lot of analysis of the data from the solar system. He looked at energy saving me measures and most importantly, he also looked at what else we can do in the future to make Wiley's even more energy efficient. And some of the charts that we'll see are actually taken from his thesis. So I'm uh, very appreciative of that. Should I talk about this? Well, yeah, maybe I'll. This is actually our work, so I'm blowing my own trumpet here. Uh, you can see here at the bottom right, our team, we take, this is our Unis W team here at Wiley's Bars doing some measurements. Uh, you can see we take safety very seriously. I'm wearing my Birkenstock safety boots. <laughs> um, and what we're doing is we're actually developing a novel um, inspection imaging solution that can actually imagine it like an x-ray machine for solar panels and this is actually a picture that we took on the roof here at Wiley's Bath using that technology. This was in fact a world first demonstration of this technology here at Wiley's Bath so I think that's pretty cool that uh, Wiley's Bath is really um, <laughs> yeah so this is something we're proud of and we hope that we can take this um, technology to commercial operation in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. 
This chart here shows you the typical generation profile from our solar system here at Wiley's Bath. As you might expect, so that's the yellow line here. I hope you can see it at the back. So you can see the sun comes up around 7 o'clock. Then the solar panels start generating. The generation peaks around midday at 10 kilowatts. That, as I said, this is limited by the inverter. And then it drops off towards the late afternoon. Now, when you look very carefully, you will see that this curve is not exactly symmetrical. You see the drop-off in the evening is a bit more um, abrupt than in the morning. So, Ziv, Ziv, do you have any idea what might be causing this? No, Ziv does, of course. Yes? The hill. The, the hill is blocked the, from the west. Yes, shading, exactly. So we have a couple of trees. So when the sun sets in the afternoon, well done, Nicola. Um, yeah, it's, but yeah, it's, it's, it, that's exactly it. So we're losing a little bit of generation from the shading by the trees, but it's actually reasonably minimal. The total generation on that particular day was 75 kilowatt hours. Total consumption at Wiley's Bath on that day was 170. And that shows that the small system here on the roof generated 44% of all electricity that we used on that particular day. Nice, huh? Very nice. Here's another chart, and that shows another important thing. This one actually shows 24 hours sometime in 2023. Again, you see the yellow curve, that sort of typical generation profile from morning to evening. And then in purple, you see the consumption. Yeah? And you can see a couple of things. First of all, you see there's consumption at nighttime. Of course, we don't have solar generation at nighttime. At nighttime, we're running fridges, we're running freezers, we're turning on electric hot water heaters and so on. <clears throat> and then you can see here in the morning, the staff at Wiley's Bath arrive and they're turning on the coffee machine, they're turning other things on, so it's a fair bit of consumption there. But what you can see, and that's the main part here, is that the yellow curve is almost entirely contained underneath the purple. So what that means is that almost 100% of the electricity that we generate from the roof can actually be used on site. It's only these tiny little specks of yellow here, there and there, where you see that the generation is actually slightly higher than our consumption, so this is when we need to feed that electricity back into the grid. But that percentage is extremely small. PV generation is extremely predictable. You might not think it, but it is. So David, the student, has actually used a software to predict how much electricity the solar system here would generate each month. And it's not surprising, it's a lot higher in summer, it's a bit lower in winter, and this is actually what he forecast would happen in that particular year for a total generation of 15 megawatt hours or 15,000 kilowatt hours. The next chart, and I have to apologize, that's the same data that was here in yellow is shown on his next chart in blue. I don't know why he chose that colors, those colors. But what we're looking at here is if you compare the blue and the orange, that is the predicted generation of the solar system versus the actual. So orange is actually how much we generated, blue is how much was predicted, and you can see the two curves follow each other almost perfectly. Of course, there's a bit of fluctuation, there's some better months, there's some with more or less sunshine, but overall you can see that the prediction and the, um, uh, the actual match quite well. And in terms of the annual generation, it turns out, and this is a coincidence, that the actual generation was within 1.1% of what we predicted, 15 megawatt hours. And that takes us to the all-important question of the financials of this system. It's a good story. So you see, I showed you, the PV system on Marco's roof, 35 panels, generated 15, kilowatt hour, 15 megawatt hours or 15,000 kilowatt hours in one year. And I told you also that almost all of that electricity is used on site, which means each kilowatt hour that we generate, we do not have to import that from the grid. The price we pay for kilowatt hours that we get from the grid is 42 cents. Yeah? It's a bit higher than we pay at home, so we need to actually look at that, I think. Yeah, Robert, you agree? Um, but that's our price. I checked with Serena, she sent me the electricity bill. That's our um, electricity rate. So it's an easy calculation to multiply 15,000 kilowatt hours by 42 cents. We end up with $6,270. That's how much money Wiley's Bath saves every year by having solar panels on the roof. Fantastic, isn't it? Compare that with the system cost. $15,800 is what we paid for the solar system. So you can see it's a very, very easy calculation to show that this system has actually paid for itself and has broken even after just two and a half years. Remember, 
The system was installed in 2021, in March 2021. Today is the 1st of March 2024. So right now the system has actually fully paid for itself and now it'll generate electricity for another 20, 30 years and save us $6,300 every year. And I think we should raise our glasses <laughs> and say... I'm done almost. No, no, I've got enough beer, don't worry. I might have another sip. What an amazing feel-good story, eh? We put solar cells on the roof, they sit there, and they save us $6,300 just sitting there every year for another 20, 30 years. Fantastic story. Now David, and I'm almost finished, I promised, um, has done some estimates of where else could we put solar panels. And of course, the obvious choice is potentially on the kiosk, that's the building there behind you, and on the boys' and girls' uh, change rooms. One of them is here, that's the girls, and the boys is on the other side. And he estimated that on top of the um, 15 kilowatt hours, 15 megawatt hours that we generate on Marco's roof, if we put solar panels on this roof, we could double actually our electricity generation with these extra panels. We're also going to look at other efficiency measures. We're going to potentially replace the old electric hot water heaters. These are just resistive electric hot water heaters, so extremely inefficient, with um, so-called heat pumps, which use a lot less electricity to generate the same amount of hot water. So that's all stuff that we're going to look at in the future. But I want to point out one thing, and that's the last thing I'm going to do, is that if we install more solar, it'll be slightly less financially attractive than the first system. And that's what's shown here. So again, purple is our consumption. This yellow curve here, that's the generation of the first solar system. And the red line, that is how much we would generate if we put these extra solar panels on. And you can see there's a large area, which is highlighted here in red, that is the electricity that we would generate that we cannot use on site, right? So this is energy that we'd either have to feed back into the grid or do something else with it. And one thing we could do, of course, is buy a battery. So during the day, that section here in red that we cannot use here, we could store that in a battery and then that energy could be used at these times where we have the purple. So this is what these red arrows indicate that we're shifting that energy to the other times where we do not have solar generation, where we can then provide our fridges and whatever we're using with electricity from the battery. That's one option. And that's of course just called storage. The other option is called demand side management. So one thing we could also do is try to push more demand into the times where we have this ex excess generation, right? At Wiley's Bath, that is a bit limited because yeah, there is not that much scope to do that. But in the private sector, there's plenty of scope to do that. As I said, you can turn your pool pump on during the day. You can charge your electric vehicle to, uh, during the day. You can earn everything else on during the day that doesn't have to run at night. And that's what's called demand side management. And that will be a very important factor in this energy transition. With that, I conclude. A future in Australia, in the world, with 70 terawatt of PV is feasible. And it's a future to look forward to. I think, yeah, I hope that some of you might walk home tonight with a bit of a spring in your step thinking, gee, there's a lot of negative news, there's a lot of negativity, but at least for some of those problems that the world faces, there is solutions. And for the energy, there is certainly solutions there. We just have to get on with it and do it. And it is happening as, you see, as you've seen. The road to that future is not trivial. There's technical challenges, market challenges, but that represents opportunities for Australian innovation, Australian companies. I've told you that Australia has really well and truly punched above its weight when it comes to innovation in the renewable energy R&D ecosystem. And that was established by Martin, I think exactly 50 years ago. If I'm, we were celebrating this year actually the 50th anniversary of the solar activities at UNSW. So Australia is said to be the lucky country. Once again, um, Wiley's Bath, yeah, we'll do more here at Wiley's Bath and I believe what I've told you, Wiley's Bars can really be seen as a bit of a microcosmos of what's happening with energy efficiency measures elsewhere in the world. But it is important to understand that this transition requires systematic planning and political leadership to avoid substantial inefficiencies and potentially social imbalances. And with that, I conclude and I thank you and look forward to some questions and potentially a beer later on.
I'm, I'm glad you took all those photos because we just saw most of them, I guess. Um, the uh, so Q and A questions, please. Um, oh, the, also, the, the the kiosk is open, so there's a bit of food left and, and drinks. Help yourself. This is meant to be pretty casual, so uh, please speak up. Otherwise, I'll bring the microphone to you. And don't be shy. This is a really casual environment, so don't be shy to ask questions. If I can't answer them, I'll flick them to others. Okay. Yep. In the middle. Thorsten, uh, you indicated that uh, solar production is going to increase dramatically in the, say, in the next 10 or 20 years. Is there going to be an equivalent capacity to actually store the excess? Right, you want to start with Sorry. Hello? Sorry. Yes, solar production is presumably going to increase dramatically in the next 10 to 20 years. Is there going to be the commensurate capacity to store it somewhere instead of it just disappearing into this grid. Second question, I'd, I'd like a just confirmation. The price of, of the cells, the panels, seems to have reduced you know, enough in the last five years, but from my observation, the price of the batteries has continued to increase. Okay. Brad's asking about price. <laughs> Prices, yes. So, first of all, maybe the second question first. I'm not a, an expert on battery technology, but my understanding, and some people here might confirm that, is battery prices are coming down. There's, of course, oscillations, statistical fluctuations, but batteries, lithium ion battery prices, are coming down, and especially in the context of electric vehicles. My understanding is now a kilowatt hour uh, car battery is, is less than $100. Um, I'm not sure if someone here, John, you're, nick, you're nodding, but 50 to 80 dollars. So the, 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 the answer is uh, prices for batteries are coming down. Right now, these residential batteries that I showed you, the Tesla battery, it is still quite expensive. So putting a battery in is far less economical than putting solar on your roof right now. But if, yeah, if I had my own home and uh, I would certainly do it, because it's also fun, you know. You have your, <laughs> it sure is. You get your app from your inverter, you can check how much electricity am I generating, and then you can actually store that in your battery and you can then optimize, and a couple of people here probably are nerdy like that to do that, and try to optimize, you know, how am I storing and, and using electricity. Uh, the first question was on the, um, the storage, is there enough storage for the, um, the electricity? The answer is yes. Um, First of all, a lot of utility scale solar farms in Australia right now, there's actually certain rules that when you build certain PV capacity, you have to actually add a certain amount of storage as well. But you should not be too concerned about that because what I said before is the solution for this energy system is not just generation and storage. It is distribution, it is energy efficiency, it is demand side management, and it's the mix between solar and wind, which is often extremely complementary you know, the sun shines, the wind doesn't blow, the sun goes down, the wind blows. And there is data that support that, that statistically this is extremely beneficial. So the amount of storage that you actually need to support a 100% uh, renewable energy system is a lot smaller than you actually might think. Okay, next question. Well, we go to Emma first. Um, you were saying that um, uh, the extreme growth of, of solar farms in Australia, as long as alongside the bush being full, I've also heard um, farmers claiming that solar gives off a lot of heat and upsets their farming and their, the need for water on their crops and all that sort of stuff. Is that true? Ziv, do you want to answer? <laughs> so my, I, I can give you a couple of pointers. So I've been at a couple of solar farms with my team. It's actually spectacular on these solar farms. We were on one, there was sheep grazing. They're actually sitting underneath the panels because they enjoy the shade. And they seriously do. And it's, it's fantastic. It, there's a whole sector that is called agrivoltaics, where people actually maximize the benefits of having solar and the associated shading, and then grow specific crops. I don't know much about it, Ziv does, but, but that is certainly a big uh, sector that's grown. And when people worry about the heat from a solar farm, I, I really struggle to see what, <laughs> what they're talking about. To me, this is just cynical 
BS to, to find arguments against solar. You know, people have also talked about the glare from solar panels. And I know sometimes under very specific angles there might be a bit of glare, but if you have a solar farm here in the city, you would not build a huge solar farm. But if it's somewhere in the, in the outback, who cares? And in the end, in the end, you gotta say, whatever we do, you know, something's gotta give. We need, to, we need to use electricity, we're using electricity, we need to generate it somehow. And some compromises will have to be made. And the trick is to, do, to find a compromise that is the least painful. And if some people get a little bit of glare every now and then, to me that's a much better solution than building a bloody nuclear power station that has all the other issues associated with it. No one has asked about nuclear, by the way. Anyway. <laughs> Any questions about nuclear? Nuclear, Nicola. Sorry, it's not a nuclear question. I thought that there were quite high distribution losses when you tried to transport electricity from the production to the consumer and therefore you had to build it close to consumption. Is there similar work being done to improve the efficiency of that or am I just wrong? I don't have actual numbers for transmission losses of conventional transmission lines, but if you <coughs> take, for instance, this high voltage DC transmission that I mentioned before, this is like transmitting, normally electric electricity is transmitted via AC. You can use high voltage DC, which is 1.2 megavolts, I think, 1.2 million volts. And these systems are being built in China. You could transport electricity from Perth to Sydney, gigawatts of electricity with about 10% losses. So, not a drama, and of course, building this infrastructure is not cheap. And the cost in Australia, I think, is almost secondary. The, the administrative red tape of getting something like that done, because you have to build it on land. You have to build it through different states and in different um, um, and, and regions, and everyone will, of course, argue against it, you know? If, if, if you were in China, they would just go, yep, let's build it, and in two years it'd be done. And here in Australia, yeah, we'd probably be still in there planning phase. But anyway, it can be done. There is technology to transport electricity with, with pretty minimal losses, yes. Right, we've got time for a couple more. Uh, or maybe a couple more. Uh, I just wanted to know, uh, because you did that here in retrofitting, um, uh, how easy is it to retrofit? Do you have any information on that, like, you know, sort of with units and stuff like that? Because that's uh, going to be an issue, you know, sort of for us in, in the future, you know, sort of uh, how do we actually put new solar panels on old buildings? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, retrofitting here at Wiley's Bars, to be quite honest, we actually had to do a bit of structural work before we could put the panels on. Um, but that is probably not the case for most um, freestanding houses. So most freestanding houses have sufficiently solid roofs that you can just put panels on and all you have to do is talk to Mark Abicht and he will help you uh, design the system for you and uh, the mounting structure is all pretty standard stuff now. So it's not a problem to put solar panels on normal roofs. For specific roofs where weight might be an issue, there's solutions. One of our Martin's uh, students, Zheng Rongxi, he's one of our famous um, alumni He's a billionaire now and he's actually manufacturing these ultra lightweight panels called Sunman. So they could have been used here at Wiley's Bath, but we opted to actually rebuild the roof because it had to be done anyway. So the answer is it's, it's not a big problem. For apartment buildings, it's an entirely different story because then you have questions, of course, you know, who gets the benefits of the electricity that is being generated? How is it being shared between um, apartment owners? But there are solutions for that. There's actually quite a few startup companies in Australia which are addressing that very issue. You know? How can we make solar available for renters and for um, apartment um, owners and people who rent in apartments? Because that's what I indicated in the very last word there, the social imbalances. Because we've got to make sure that in this whole energy transition, the non-haves are not left behind. You know? But I am confident that uh, solutions for that can be found as well. Hey, I like nuclear power. I, I'm just uh, curious as to solar panels must have some disadvantages, like using rare earth metals and stuff. Is it going to run out? And shouldn't we hedge our bets with nuclear power? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Short, short, short. Okay, uh, how do I make this short? 
Well, first of all, silicon panels uh, don't contain any uh, toxic materials. Silicon is basically sand, a bit of glass, a bit of aluminium. But there is some materials which actually could become a bottleneck when we talk about this terawatt scale. And silver, for example, is one of them. Because silver is used on these electrical contacts that are printed on the front surface of the solar cells. <coughs> that is so that we can solder the solar cells, interconnect them. And that, it is clear that there is not enough silver um, to, to, to just basically support this terawatt scale. But in terms of the nuclear, and I promise I'll be quick, I have a couple of slides. A cautionary tale, Hinkley Point C, your mother country, the UK, they were in a similar situation as Australia is today where there were some politicians who were pushing the nuclear agenda and they said we need to take a holistic view, we need to have all options on the table and they decided in their wisdom to build a nuclear power plant which is called Hinkley Point C, it's a 3.2 gigawatt power plant it is actually built on an existing nuclear site where there's already Hinkley Point A and B. And I won't talk about it in all detail. The short story is the original price estimates were 16 billion pounds for the construction that has now blown out to 33 billion pounds. Uh, the price that the UK government had to guarantee the EDF, which is the Electricity de France, or the a um, French electricity company, they are building this power plant and the English government had to guarantee them a wholesale price of 92.5 pence inflation adjusted. So what that means is effectively they will generate electricity and by the time that this power plant comes online they'll be paid 25 cents per kilowatt hour which is about three to four times more than the electricity cost is that we, if we use a firm renewable system. And who's going to pay for that? The UK consumer. But you can be sure the politicians who made that decision back then, they'll be long gone. They, don't will, they will not be held accountable. Talking about the timeline, that nuclear power station was first submitted to the UK Office of Nuclear Regulation in 2007. That's when an existing reactor design was submitted to an existing UK regulatory body. Back then, in, <laughs> this is quite funny, in 2007, the EDF CEO said, by 2017, at Christmas time, we will have turkeys in England being cooked using nuclear power from Hinkley Point C. That's what he said. Now, these turkeys and their children and their children are still running around in the south of England wondering what's going on here. And in 2023, at the end of 2023, they announced further delays and the commissioning date is now expected in 2028. 21 years from the date an existing design was submitted to the regulatory body to the time it is expected to be completed. This is in a country that has an existing nuclear history, existing regulatory bodies, ex existing um, um, staff expertise, they already have an existing site, they know where to put it. If we talk in Australia about building, so, uh, building nuclear, we would start 10 years earlier because first we would decide where do we actually want to put it. Look, the, look what happened with Snowy Hydro. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a fair point. But in the terms of nuclear, it is clear that if you want to build massively complex infrastructure like that, the idea that we could do it more efficiently here than they can do it in England where they've done it 100 times before is just ludicrous. You know what's driving the sun? That fireball up there that's at 6,000 Kelvin surface temperature? Nuclear fusion. There's nuclear fusion happening in the sun. Hydrogen atoms are fused into helium. That's what's driving it and that's going to keep it going for 5 billion years. So if you want it, you could say the sun up there is the ultimate nuclear reactor. It's sitting up there. It's sitting in a safe distance. It is provided by nature for free. And not only that, it beams the energy that it creates to us for free with light and all we have to do is put bloody flat panels on the surface to turn that light into electricity. So let's get on with it. I think those turkeys jumped on the nuclear submarine project. <laughs> um, they, uh, look, thanks mate, that, that's awesome. Um, 
don't run off. Uh, please, Thorsten's around. Other experts in the room are around. Um, the bar's open. There's a bit of food left. Uh, I'd like you all to thank Professor Thorsten Trucky. Um, stay around, stay around, and enjoy the scenery and, and have a drink.